Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Deborah Ancona, and I'm on the faculty here at Sloan in the Work and Organization Studies group, and also the faculty director of the MIT Leadership Center. It is a pleasure to welcome you all here today to the Dean's Innovative Leadership Series, and really a total privilege to be able to introduce our speaker for the day, Alan Mulally. Now we all know that having a great title and being a great leader are two very different things. So I could easily introduce Alan Mulally as the former CEO of Ford, or the former president and CEO of Boeing Commercial Airplanes, or as a new member of the Google board. But truthfully, this does not really begin to tell this unique leadership story. There is a reason that Alan Mulally was named the number three on Fortune's world's greatest leaders. One of the 30 world's best, world's best CEOs by Barron's Magazine. There is a reason that he was asked to be an advisor to President Obama on ways to encourage companies to increase exports and enter new markets. There is a reason why Bill Ford Jr. actually did a little bit of a dance and had some champagne when he learned that Alan Mulally was going to take over his job as the CEO of Ford. Well, we at the Sloan School have a model and a paper, which many of you have read, called In Praise of the Incomplete Leader. I have to say that Alan Mulally comes as close as I've ever seen to being a complete leader. In terms of sense making, when Alan moved from Boeing to Ford, he had to quickly understand the dynamics of the automotive industry, the realities of a failing corporation, the rich history of the Ford family, a changing economy, and shifting consumer preferences. He watched, he interviewed, he listened to everyone, and then he mapped and went, went along. In terms of visioning, Alan introduced the concept of one Ford with a comprehensive strategy built around people, products, and productivity. And oh, by the way, he had to shift people's mindsets so that they actually believed that Ford was not going to fail, but could reach a new reality. In terms of relating, there was the board, the shareholders, the suppliers, the UAW, the customers, the management team, and on and on and on. None were too happy with the way things were, not a single one. Furthermore, Alan came in with these really strange ideas, like working as a team, working with transparency and honesty in a company steeped in politics and turf battles. He broke up those turfs, and people liked him in the end. Pretty amazing. Finally, in terms of inventing, Alan had to drive relentless implementation with the goal of achieving profitability when the company was losing billions of dollars a quarter. And when the company had been basically mortgaged to the hilt in order to pay for the turnaround. But he did it. The company that had been going out of business for 30 years became profitable. Alan Mulally harnessed the collective talent at Ford and saved the American icon which, by the way, is the name of a book written about him, and I highly recommend it. It's fantastic reading. He saved an American icon from extinction. During the automotive crisis of 2008 and 2009, Ford was the only one of the big three not to need a government bailout. So please join me in welcoming a former Sloan Fellow and a global icon all on his own, Alan Mulally. Good job. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Wow. That's pretty neat. <laughs> so Deborah mentioned I was the number three of the world's greatest leaders, and I can understand the Pope, because the Pope was number one. <laughs> but Andrew Merkel in Germany, I don't know. 
Um, so I'm really glad to be here with you. I'm really glad to be back at, at uh, MIT. I love MIT. I chose MIT over Stanford uh, when I was, had a chance to be a Sloan Fellow. And so I would just like to share with you that I think MIT and Sloan uh, absolutely rocks, okay? That's how I feel about you guys. You're getting the best education in the world, and man, does the world need your leadership. It needs your leadership more than ever with everything that's going on today. And leadership really counts. So I asked Deborah how would be the best way to, to um, uh, have our meeting today, and she said, well, if you could just share your journey uh, at Boeing and at Ford, and especially what you've learned about operational and strategic leadership, but also especially about working together. And then uh, everybody has a lot of questions, and so would you please leave a lot of time for questions. And I'll be glad to do that. Matter of fact, I'll answer any question you want to ask. For example, if you would like to know what it's, how to uh, testify in front of Congress uh, on behalf of your bankrupt competitors, uh, I'll be glad to answer that. The most important thing about that is that you fly there on your own private jet. <laughs> it gets the conversation off to a really, really good start. So whatever you like to uh, talk about, I'd be glad to talk about too. So um, I, uh, I joined Boeing, and I had the honor of serving at Boeing for 37 years. And I was on uh, the design team for every Boeing airplane as an aeronautical and astronautical engineer. And so the 707, the 727, the 737, the 747, the 757, the 767, and I had the honor to serve on the cockpit and the flight management system, the autopilot and the navigation and guidance and control system of the 57, the 67, the first airplanes that had the common cockpit. Also, I was asked to be the chief engineer uh, and head of the design for the 777, which all of you around here travel all around the world on. It's your favorite airplane, I might add. That's what you, you said that. Uh, and then also as a general manager, and then I was, the, I was asked to be the, uh, the president and CEO of commercial airplanes. Also, at the time, uh, Boeing bought McDonnell, Douglas, and Rockwell. And so I was asked as a commercial airplane person to join uh, that team and integrate all these fantastic assets. And we created the Boeing Defense and Space uh, Company. So all the satellites, all the uh, fighters, the launch vehicles, the space shuttle, the space station, uh, the helicopters, uh, we, we created this powerhouse to support the, uh, support the war fighters around the world. So in all, those, all of those experience I had at Boeing, there's just some, some lessons learned um, that I just wanted to share with you. Uh, on every airplane program, uh, it's always really important that you have a compelling vision for what that, for what that airplane is going to do, and everybody knows what that is. So whether it's a short range, whether it's a long range, whether it's point to point, whether it's going to do direct polar routes, it's so important that the entire team knows what that vision is so we can align our efforts to it. And on a commercial airplane, they're probably, well, undoubtedly the most sophisticated products in the world. A commercial airplane has around 4 million parts. They fly halfway around the world. The level of safety is absolutely uh, incredible. I don't, there's not another product like it. And you usually have uh, one and a half to two million people working on a commercial airplane, and you're creating something out of nothing. It's, it's brand new. So sometimes things are going well, sometimes they're not going well. And it's really important that everybody knows what the strategy is to create this, uh, create this vehicle, that what the technology strategy is, what the working together strategy is, the digital product definition, the digital pre-assembly, what the manufacturing plan is going to be around the world. Everybody has to know everything. Uh, and also, uh, you have to have an environment that you just relentlessly implement this. And that's where the business plan review comes from every Thursday morning, where everybody is uh, together uh, once a week for two and a half hours where you review everything about the plan, what the status is against the plan, and the areas need special attention. And we'd always color code uh, all of the slides. We usually have around 300 slides. The business units would present, the engineering would present, manufacturing, procurement, and we'd do that in about two and a half hours, and then everybody would know everything, and then we'd uh, work the red items that need, that we wanted to turn the reds, the yellows, the greens. So, this thing about people working together and people are first, everybody's got to be on the team, uh, you got to listen to each other, you got to trust each other, uh, it's got to be transparent, uh, you're accountable to the entire team to get this done. Those are some of the principles and practices that, that are really effective and you're going to get a chance with your great skills that you learned here uh, at MIT and Sloan and I think the biggest thing you're going to learn and appreciate is the power of working together and what a skill it is to learn how to do that. So I'd encourage you to uh, in addition to everything else that you're doing to really 
uh, avail yourself of every opportunity to learn how to effectively work as a, as a team. So I, uh, I loved Boeing. I, had, I never thought I would leave Boeing. And um, I had one more airplane I wanted to help uh, design. That was a replacement for the 737. And, uh, and then I got this call from Bill Ford. And, he, and Bill started, and Bill's this really neat leader, and he was the president, he was the chairman, the president, and the CEO of Ford at the time. And, um, and he started sharing the story about Ford, and the more I learned about it, the worse it, it sounded. <laughs> but I, I didn't, I found it so interesting, because I didn't say, I didn't reject his advances right away, and I really wanted to know more about Ford. And, uh, you know, with Boeing, I've been all around the world uh, over and over and over again. And, and, of course, Ford was everywhere around the world. And in our hometown in Lawrence, Kansas, we had a, a Ford dealership there and it had a big blue oval. And, and we got our first car there and, and we wrecked our first car there. And, <laughs> and then uh, they'd fix our car there and they'd sometimes tell our parents and sometimes they wouldn't. <laughs> so, you know, we had a really tight relationship with the, with the Ford store because they're just the fabric of, of all the communities around the world. So I was listening to the story, and and um, and then as Deborah mentioned, I, do, I was doing my my uh, uh, homework, my due diligence, and, and and here's what I found out. So Ford um, had really become a, a house of brands, and we know that beautiful blue oval, but Ford had purchased Aston Martin, Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo, Mazda, because they couldn't figure out how to make money uh, uh, with with the Ford brand. And so it was very, very uh, complicated house of brands. And, that, and everybody lost track of what that beautiful blue oval stands for. And as you know, in marketing, the most important thing is, it, is that brand clarity. Because people, that's the pr brand promise that, that we're being offered. Also, Ford was very regionalized. And Henry Ford was brilliant at the time because he, when he set up Ford uh, over 100 year, 113 years ago, he established Ford in every country around the world which was unheard of. There's no other company that ever did that. And the reason he did it is that he not only wanted to provide great cars and trucks, but he wanted everybody around the world to be able to work for Ford also and contribute to the economy and energy independence and security and environmental sustainability and provide great jobs and great careers. And of course, we were, we were uh, competing with these global powerhouses, a lot of the countries of which have no natural resources. They have to actually bring in resources into their country, create something of value, export it, and then bring the wealth back to their country because that's the only way they're going to survive. Uh, a good example is Japan. Another good example is South Korea. And, and of course, uh, there are a lot of government uh, company partnerships because it's almost mercantilism, which is why we, need, we really need free trade rules that, that uh, make sense. So it was fantastic at the time because uh, uh, everybody was participating. But over time, they become very regionalized, and there, were, there was no synergy among these Fords all around the world. So they had their own product plan, they had their own manufacturing procurement, and there was no synergy competing with uh, our global competitors. Uh, also, uh, the consumer uh, tastes were changing because people wanted uh, smaller vehicles that were as neat as the bigger vehicles and had all the same capability, quality, and fuel efficiency and safety. And we didn't have a comprehensive, complete family uh, of vehicles. Also, uh, the compet competition was really increasing, and it's a very competitive industry, as you know, uh, in the automobile industry, and either uh, you're on the leading edge of it or you're not, and we had chosen to be a kind of a fast follower on technology, so uh, we were losing market share. Uh, also, in the United States, uh, we were sized for 26% market share, and we were going through 9% market share, so we had all, all of the assets and the facilities and people and computing the three times what we needed. Uh, also, the economy was slowing down. The fuel prices were going up. Uh, we were losing money on every brand uh, and every model. And everybody was scared, and there was no plan to deal with that. Now, outside of that, it was going pretty well. <laughs> so you're probably wondering why would I ever leave Boeing and go to Ford? And, and at the end of the day, I really believe in manufacturing. And I really believe in engineering. And, and no country is, has been strong and sustainable if they don't have a really strong manufacturing base all around the world. And of course, uh, research and development, 70% of all the research and development in the United States and around the world is associated with manufacturing with the big M. So it's just so important 
Um, and Ford was so important for so many people around the world that at the end of the day, I felt like I was being asked to serve a second uh, global and American icon. So I, I, uh, I, left, um, I left Boeing and I came to Ford. So I, I arrive at the airport in, uh, in Detroit and uh, they picked me up in a Land Rover. And I've left Boeing with brand clarity to come to Ford with brand clarity and they picked me up in a Land Rover. I said, a note to self. I wonder what everybody here is working on. And then we, we drive to the world headquarters. It's 12 stories high. Uh, they call it the Glass House. And it's the world headquarters, the seventh largest corporation in the world. And, uh, we, and it's, it's uh, in Dearborn. It's where Henry Ford was born. It's like beautiful countryside. And Henry wanted to make life easier and more worthwhile. And, and I was just so excited, and even though I was in this Land Rover. And we drive in, and we drive into the basement where all the executives park. All their cars are in the, in the, in the lot. And we drive in, and there's not one Ford vehicle <laughs> in the parking lot. There's Aston Martins and Jaguars and Land Rovers and Volvos. I got another note to self. I wonder what everybody is working on here. So uh, we go upstairs, and... Um, and I meet the team, and, and Bill uh, takes me out to, the, uh, we have this uh, huge auditorium, and we had 40, 400 journalists there, just like here, and we had probably another 1,200 journalists that were on, online, because the automobile industry and all the technology goes with it is, is nearly 20% of the world's GDP. It's just a huge, huge, um, huge part of our, our economic development. So everybody wanted to know about this new person, this, this airplane guy that, that arrived at Boeing, at Ford. And so um, Bill introduces me, and, and the journalists are all asking all these penetrating questions like, why did you come, and what are you going to do, and what's our strategy going to be, and, and did you know we're in trouble? <laughs> and uh, because all their lives depend on this also. So uh, it got to be kind of familiar, and it's uh, getting more confidence. And then finally, one of the journalists said, the two things I loved what they said, the first one was, so, Ms. Molly, um, uh, we're in trouble here, and you're clearly not an automobile guy, and you don't know anything about this business. And it's a very complicated business, starting with the products themselves. So what does it mean to us that you're here as our leader when we're in trouble, and you know nothing? And I kind of rub my chin. I kind of, you know, remember there's like 1,600 people listening to this conversation, plus all the employees and the suppliers and everybody else. Uh, and so I, I rub my chin very thoughtfully and I said, you know, I agree with you. Uh, the automobile industry is, is very sophisticated, starting with the products themselves. Matter of fact, the average car or truck has around 10,000 parts. And you think about the quality and the fuel efficiency and safety and the materials and the aerodynamics and the system integration. That, I mean, they're very, very sophisticated products. I might point out, however, that the 777 airplane has four million parts, <laughs> and it stays in the air. <laughs> the, 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 the next day, three-inch headlines across the Detroit News, we think we got the right guy. <laughs> it was so funny. I mean, they're kind of hurting for news there, too. The other, the other thing I loved about them, about, so one of the journalists said, so, Mr. Malai, with all due respect, uh, I don't know whether you know this, but uh, the Ford Motor Company is a very buttoned up place. I mean, a lot of cufflinks and starched shirts and, and three-piece suits. And, and I said, that's, that's good to know. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a customer in person. So I said, do you have a question? They said, well, yes, we've noticed that the color of your slacks don't match the color of your coat. And, and I, I don't know, I stopped wearing suits about 45 years ago. And, uh, <laughs> because uh, I just want to be like a real live person. So, I, so I, I looked down and said, that's right. And do you have a question? They said, well, you know, this is a pretty buttoned up place. Is it going to be okay for the, for the executives at Ford tomorrow to wear sport coat, sport coat and, and uh, slacks? And they're of different colors. So I rubbed my chin again very thoughtfully and very decisively. I said, yes. <laughs> Next day, three-inch headlines. The culture change already begun at Ford. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, we need to get going. Remember the working together? It's the only thing I know. Uh, talented people working together, uh, coming together around a vision for your organization, what it wants to accomplish, a strategy for achieving it, and then the business plan review process is relentless implementation of everybody every week. 
uh, knowing what the status is, the red, the yellows, and greens, and then working together to uh, create a viable, profitably growing company. So uh, we come together around a vision. We found that in, in an a advertisement that Henry Ford took out in the Saturday Evening Post on January 24th of 1925. And he described a vision of opening the highways to all mankind. And he laid out the entire strategy so that everybody could afford and also work at Ford afford these great vehicles, and no one at the time could afford a, a, a vehicle. And he laid out, it had to be really important, it had to be uh, large in scale about continuous improvement. And of course, everybody around the world came to see Henry Ford on what he did, including Mr. Toyota uh, of Toyota. And so he also said he realized that his success at that time, which is like 50% market share, uh, was great, but he really looked forward to the opportunity to serve all mankind. So that had us all crying. That was worthy of committing our lives to. And then we also agreed on a strategy. Uh, and of course, the strategy was very different than what Ford uh, had gotten, the strategy that had gotten Ford to this place. So we agreed to uh, focus on Ford. We sold Aston Martin, Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo, and Mazda. We also agreed that we we're going to serve all the markets around the world. And we also agreed that we're going to have a complete family of vehicle, uh, small, medium, and large, and cars, utilities, and trucks. So the Fiesta all the way up through the F-Series truck. We also agreed that every vehicle that we put out from then on would be best in class, not a fast follower, but would be best in quality and fuel efficiency and safety and really smart design like connectivity. We also agreed that we're going to restructure ourselves as fast as we could to stop the, the, uh, the bleeding on the money. And to show you how bad that was, the first forecast I saw in September of that year for the entire year for profits was a $17 billion loss. And four months later, we achieved it. <laughs> so this wasn't a forecast accuracy issue. We needed a different strategy and, and a different plan. And we only had like $28 billion, I think, in the bank. So we were, you know, we would have been gone within a, a few months if we wouldn't act decisively. So we decided we we're going to restructure the business. We we're going to size our production to the real demand. And also, at the same time, we we're going to accelerate the development of all these new vehicles so that not only would we uh, be able to save the company, but we'd come out the other side and be uh, competitive with the best in the world. We also agreed that uh, we needed a small home improvement loan because to do something of this magnitude, we needed, we needed capital. So um, we went to the banks. And I can remember that I was sitting with the, with the, with the finance team, and the chief finance officer was going to give the, this presentation to the banks. We had 500 banks lined up in New York City. And uh, so we had this plan that I've just described, all laid out, out on a few charts, and, and they're all ready to go. And I said, this is great. You guys are going to do great. Please give me a call and tell me how it's going. And they started looking at their shoes, and I said, what's wrong? And they said, we can't raise any money by presenting this. I said, why not? They said, because we presented this in the past, and we've never been able to deliver on it. So I said, what do you think we ought to do? And then they introduced me to another automobile uh, phrase. They said, well, Mr. Malai, you're the, you're the only new model we have. So you, you need to go give the presentation yourself. So I flew in that same corporate jet up to, Washington, uh, to New York City. And we presented for three days to 500 banks. And at the end of uh, seven days, we raised $23.5 billion. So we could finance the restructuring. We could finance uh, the new products. And we could handle a recession. We never thought it was going to get as bad as it did. And uh, of course, the, the most important thing about that is that we had leveraged all the assets of Ford. And so if we couldn't turn this around and create a, a profitably growing company, uh, Ford would be would be no longer, and uh, the assets would have been given back to the banks. Now, the banks don't want your asset. The reason they loan you money is they really think you have an idea to create value, and they'd like you to pay it back. Sometimes they'd be glad if you pay it back more, even more slowly. They even make more money. So uh, the, the last part of the strategy is that we agreed we we're going to need to work together as one team all around the world and share everything, know what the plan, the status, the areas need special attention, and really help each other which is very different as I, as I described to you. So we started to go to work. So we had a strategy, we had a plan. We, uh, the entire team, the business units around the world, that P&L, the engineering, manufacturing across the world. Uh, we started our business plan reviews. We did at six, started at six o'clock every Thursday to hit all the time zones around the world, from Sydney to Shanghai to Beijing to, to um, uh, Cologne to Sao Paulo and, and throughout the United States and Canada. 
and we're in a round table and we have screens and we're all on the internet and you can see every location around the world and the leader is there and, and we also invite guests to watch us work and uh, we agreed on about 320 charts, same thing at Boeing and they, I, I, I introduced them to color coding that I wanted them to color their charts about how it was going about their plan and they that was very hard they didn't understand this at all because if you ever uh, if you ever brought a problem to your supervisor or your boss and you didn't have a, a solution for it then people just disappeared because that's the management philosophy that most companies had and still you have to be really careful about uh, helping move us along in this area too because a lot of companies are still like that and it's the most it's the most destructive management policy in the history of mankind because now you're managing a secret it's still a red item but nobody knows it, so you can't help each other. So uh, they understand the principle, and so I thought, okay, this is great, they all agreed. So we started our first business plan reviews, and all 320 charts are green. <laughs> and it's that way for a couple of weeks, and I, I stopped the meeting, and, and, I, and they don't know me, and I don't know them, and I said, do you, you know, you do know now, I mean, we all know now that we're gonna lose $17 billion. Is there anything, just a couple little things that might not be going well? And of course, the eye contact goes to the floor, and, and they're, they're scared. They don't know what's going to happen if they do that, and no one says anything. And then we go to the next green chart, and next green chart. And then I didn't know this until Deborah was mentioned in the American Icon book. I, I was reading the American Icon book when I received it, and it's described in this meeting ahead of our Thursday meeting. And Mark Fields, who was running all the Americas, um, they ran into a, an actuator on the lift gate on a new edge that was being produced in Oakville, Canada. And so he did what we we agreed to, he stopped production. When you stop production on airplanes or cars, it's a really a big deal. So he had like 10,000 edges sitting on the ten tundra. And, uh, and so he's in the business plan review. They just stopped it in the morning. He's looking at his charts that he's gonna show the next day. And up comes the launch chart. And on every launch, we're usually launching about 40, 45 vehicles around the world. There are three columns, one for technical readiness, one for scheduled readiness, and one for financial impact. And they're all green and he's just stopped production. So Mark says to the team, um, you know, this looks like one of those red things Alan's talking about. <laughs> and somebody on the team says, so what's your point, Mark? They said, well, I think what he's saying is we need to color code it red <laughs> so that we can all work on it together. And then somebody else said, Mark, just tell us what do you want to do? You, you, what color do you want me, us to color this? He said, well, I think we should color it red, red, and red. And then somebody else says, it was really nice to know you, Mark. Good luck. <laughs> because they knew what happened if somebody showed a red and they didn't have an answer. So everybody gathers the next day. It's 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and we start going through the charts, and they're all green. And then we come to Mark, and up comes this red chart. And I mean, it was just quiet. The air was gone in the room. People are looking down at their their shoes again and, and just and all, kind of looking at me at the same time to see what was really going to happen now. And so Mark said, got a lift act actuator on the lift gate, stop production, we're working on tricking to figure out what to do about it. So I started to clap. And I didn't think about it at the time because I was, I was clapping for a different reason, but everybody there thought, there's a sign. The two doors behind me are going to open up. Two very large people are going to come in <laughs> and Mark would be disappearing. And so I clapped and I said, you know, I said, Mark, that is great visibility, great visibility. Uh, what can we do to help you out? And Derek Cusack, who was leaving, leading engineering uh, across the world at the time, said, you know, I think I've seen that issue on such and such. I'll get that data over to you right away, Mark. And Benny Fowler, who was leading quality, said, I think I've seen such and such, kind of the same comment. And the coolest one was Joe Hendricks, who was leading manufacturing worldwide, said, you know, well, this is Ford. We're not the smartest people in the world. We're going to figure this out. You're going to need some manufacturing engineers. I'll get them identified, get them up to Oakville. They'll be ready to replace the parts, put the new ones in, and get the production flowing around the world. And that, that whole interchange took maybe eight, nine seconds. And then we went on to the next, I said, thank you, and went on to the next green chart and the next green chart. And, and, and Mark's still there. And then the next week, uh, Mark's the only red chart again because they haven't figured it out yet. But Mark's still there. And so everybody keeps looking at the slides, but they keep looking at Mark, and they keep looking at me. So why is Mark still there? Clearly, he's red, and he should be removed. And so uh, maybe the next week, they found the, the issue, and they're working with the supplier, and it turned to yellow. 
and Mark's still there. The next week it turns to green, they got the parts, the vehicles start flowing all around the world, and Mark is still there. And so the next week, guess what? All 320 chart colors they were. <laughs> they were not all red, but they looked like a rainbow. And Mark was still there. And what everybody decided was that they were going to trust the process and it was going to be okay, not only okay, but it was expected to share what the real situation was and you'd be appreciated for it. And then also we were going to agree that we're going to work together on every one of those reds and turn the reds to yellows to green. And at that point is the most kind of terrifying and exhilarating moment at my, my short career at Ford because I knew that we were now making sense of the whole situation together and we were dealing with reality and we also agreed we had a plan to go from this reality that we're in to creating a viable, exciting, profitably growing company. And we're going to be able to do that now because we could, we could actually work together. So how did it, um, how did it turn out? So uh, I'm in awe about how it turned out. So we, we got through the tsunamis. We got through the uh, Asian financial crisis. We got, we got through the financial crisis in the United States where we're, we were this close to being in a depression that was, that was worse than uh, uh, the 1929 depression. And we used our working together principles and practices through the whole thing. And now... Um, we are the number one brand in the United States. We're number one and number two in all the European countries. We're the fastest growing brand in Russia. We're the fastest growing brand in Asia Pacific, fastest growing brand in China. And we're enhancing all of our capabilities and our production all around the world. We're actually uh, accelerating Henry Ford's original vision of being part of the economy and providing great jobs and great careers around the world. Also, the people that know uh, cars uh, believe we have the finest uh, car lineup of anybody in the world today. The Fiesta, the Focus, the Fusion, the Taurus, the Mustang, the Escape, the Edge, the Flex, the Explorer, the Expedition, the Ranger, the F-Series, and the Transit family. And so that family supports all the customers' uh, wants and needs uh, around the world. Uh, they're the, we're the most efficient with the highest quality, fuel efficiency, and safety, and connectivity of, of any automobile company. Looking at all the stakeholders, uh, our suppliers, uh, we started out, we were uh, right above GM is the worst company to work for when you're a supplier because we kept giving them hockey sticks on volume and then they'd put in facilities and they'd lose more money and we wouldn't, we wouldn't turn the corner, we'd just keep going down. And they have now rated us number two behind Toyota on who they prefer to work with. Uh, on, on the uh, uh, bankers, we repaid all of our, the money that we borrowed uh, and more. And on the investors who invested in, in Ford, our intraday low on stock was a dollar one, and a five billion dollar market cap, and the stock now is appreciated approximately one thousand eight hundred and thirty-seven percent, and so our market cap now is, is sixty billion dollars, um, and so they're all happy. Um, our our uh, Ford store owners are in the best shape they've ever been in profitability and throughput, and now they're, they're making the customer experience just fantastic when you go into a Ford store. And maybe the neat thing I'm just so pleased about is how the employees feel. And Deborah and I were talking about this earlier, that we use an employee survey to find out how everybody thinks about the company, and there's, they have one measure that is called percent positive about how the employee feels about the company. And, uh, the average in the United States is less than 50% feel positive about the company, which means that most people are working at companies as a job, but they're not building a cathedral. And so I'd, I always thought this was really important about how people feel and create an environment where people loved working there and they knew what the strategy was and the plan and the leadership and they felt they were contributing and they felt like they were appreciated. So at Boeing, I think we got it up to a percent positive of 65 or 66%, which is one of the highest in the world, and you know what it is at Ford? 89%. 89% of the employees believe in the company, where it's going, what it stands for, and that they are contributing, they feel appreciated. Our brand um, has had the, the largest positive movement of any brand, of any large corporation around the world ever uh, in history. And so um, we have got, we got everything funded, all the vehicles are funded, the technology roadmap for for uh, uh, the internal combustion engine, uh, alternate fuels uh, uh, like uh, natural gas, the electrification of the vehicles, uh, hydrogen and fuel cells in the uh, future. We have all of that enabling technology uh, funded. And we did something that's very rare 
in Ford's history. We had an, actually an orderly transition plan of the CEO. And you remember the fellow that put up the first red, Mark Fields? He, it turned out that Mark Fields is the, is the person that replaced me, succeeded me as CEO. So they're, they're on their way and they're doing great. And I would uh, just recommend to you that you just go down to the Ford store and take a look when we take care of all of your automotive needs. <laughs> okay, so that's my uh, report to the committee. And uh, with that, we have some, uh, what we call mic wranglers. Uh, it's a skill that takes a long time to develop. And just raise your hand and we'll bring you the microphone and uh, if you maybe introduce yourself and what you're studying, it would be great, and where, where you're from. And if, you're, if it's a penetrating question that you don't want to say your name, just say row 18 has this question. Okay, we got one back here. Got one over here. Okay, here comes the mic to you. Okay, hi, hello. Okay, where are you? Hello. Okay, uh, yes, I'm working. You. Yeah. Hi, thank you for being here. You're welcome. I'm Juan Carlos Garza. I'm a Sloan Fellow, 2016. Very good. I have just a, a quick question about, about leadership. During the crisis of 2008, you were the only OEM that didn't ask for a bailout from the, from the U.S. government. Yes. But you decided also to help your two competitors. Why was it? I love hanging out with you guys. And, and, there, and there's no press, right? Yeah. Because I have to... I have to I'm trying real hard not to make news right now. Uh, got a lot of people. I know, but it's, but it's for MIT's use. Okay. We're, just a second. We're negotiating. <laughs> MIT's use. Okay, great. It works for me uh, because I really don't want to. I, I have to be careful about how I answer questions, and that's a fantastic question. So, um, so it. My gosh, that was such a serious time for the United States, but also for, for the world. Um, and uh, so we figured out early that GM and Chrysler were in trouble. And, uh, they were, and this is a lesson in humility uh, because GM was the largest corporation in the world at that time, the largest corporation, and they were completely bankrupt. They couldn't get one dollar in debtor in possession financing to restructure themselves. So they had nowhere to go uh, but to liquidate. And Chrysler the same way. And, um, and Ben Bernanke was calling, he was Secretary of the Fed, or Fed Chairman, and, and Treasury was calling because the purchase of an automobile is the biggest decision besides your house that people make. So we were like the pulse on the economy and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And the banks are starting to get into trouble. And uh, everybody's worried about a run on the bank and liquidity. And so, I mean, it was a serious situation. And I agreed with uh, the Fed and with Treasury and everybody that if GM and Chrysler would have gone into bankruptcy and would have gone into free fall, they would have taken the entire supply base, all the technology that goes into it, all the companies. Um, it would have taken nearly 20% of the US GDP into uh, bankruptcy. And Ben really was a student of the Depression, the chairman of the Fed, and he, uh, he really believed that would have happened. We would have gone into a depression that was worse than 1929, and we were driven, we would drag the whole world into it too. So to your question, we didn't need the money because we had moved aggressively earlier, plus we were well on this, this, this plan that I shared with you. We were, we, matter of fact, we had gotten back to, we'd gone from that $17 billion loss to $100 million of profit in that first quarter of 2008, we were so happy just to have it not be red. Because <laughs> if you have brackets around your numbers, that means in business you have no idea what you're doing. I still feel a vice like that. Um, and the assets ought to be given to somebody else. And so um, they, they were gonna go to the government and we felt like, and the, and the government asked us if we would come testify too because they didn't understand that Ford really didn't need the money either. They just assumed that we were close to bankruptcy too. And so they invited us to go. And you're, when you're invited, that means you're invited to go testify. But you're still invited. <laughs> and we decided at the end that even though it was against every uh, um, laissez-faire capitalist principle that I know, because the market ought to allocate precious resources, right? We all believe that because that's how, that's how you drive efficiency and you make products that people want and value and create value. And so to go testify on behalf of your bankrupt competitors when they ought to be 
gone it was very surreal. But in the end, we agreed it was the right thing for the United States, but also the right thing for, for the world. And so, um, just so, so that's the serious part. So, we had the, so I went to testify on their behalf. So here's how the first hearings went. Um, so when you're testifying, it looks just like this. It's like a gladiator movie. <laughs> and so you, you watch it on C-SPAN, and, and, and we're sitting here, and the cameras are right here, the C-SPAN cameras. And then they have a long table, and they have little glasses of water. And all the press are all around you. And the reason you have small glasses of water is that you can't go to the bathroom, because you're surrounded by all these people. Uh, and you're there for six hours. They give you a little, a little glass of water. <laughs> and <laughs> trying to stay alive. And the, of course, the camera's right on your face, looking up to your nose hairs. And so it's a kind of a tense situation. And then all the congressmen are all like this, in rows. And so you get five minutes five minutes that you get a ch chance to share your story about why you've been here, to, why you're asked to testify. And then every congressman and senator gets a chance to ask you questions for five minutes. And they're, but they don't ever have to be there together. So they're coming and going and doing all their stuff. So they ask you a lot of questions over and over again. And you can watch on TV. If you get irritated as a person that's testified, then you're really dead meat. And so uh, you have to be so respectful. You got to listen to the question. You got to answer it as best of your ability. And then some of them like to ask a really, really penetrating question on the last 30 seconds of their five minutes, just so that you know and everybody else knows that they're really smart and this is a great question. <laughs> so they found out that uh, the three of us, GM and Chrysler and Ford, actually flew to the hearings on our private jets. And that we didn't even have the dec decency to jet pool. <laughs> we flew on separate planes. So they found that out, and then one of the senators, in their last 30 seconds, said, so, Mr. General Motors, why did you fly here on a corporate jet to ask us for precious taxpayer money? That was a great question. And Mr. G uh, GM said, I'm really sorry. That was, that was not, not good. And they turned to Chrysler and said, why did you fly here on a corporate jet to ask for precious taxpayer money? He said, I, I'm sorry. That was not very good judgment. So they turned to me. And they said, Mr. Mulally, why did you fly here on a corporate jet to ask for precious taxpayer money? So, uh, so I rubbed my chin very thoughtfully again. <laughs> I said, well, Senator, with all due respect, I'm not here asking for precious taxpayer money. I'm here to testify on behalf of my bankrupt competitors for the good of the United States and the global economy. Just answer the question, Mr. Mullally. <laughs> I said, so now it's a different question. Because he says, why did you fly here on a corporate jet? Well, now it's a different question. So I thought, oh, I'm really caught now, but I do have my integrity. So I rubbed my chin again. I said, Senator, with all due respect, I am an airplane guy. And that's why we invented airplanes, for long distance travel. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. <laughs> but, <laughs> but your question is so big, and, it, it's, and you're all going to get a chance to do this in your careers, um, that everything we do, there's always this factor of what is the right thing to do for the good of everybody. And it was the right thing for us to, to go and testify on their behalf, even though it was um, very surreal. Hi, Alan. My name's David. I'm a Sloan Fellow. You the sound like thing? you're from Australia. Um, no, uh, wrong, wrong country, <laughs> right hemisphere. I'm from <laughs> New South Zealand. Africa. Oh, oh, very good. The first thing I'd like to know is what car do you currently drive? And I'd also like to know, what opinion do you have about Elon Musk and Tesla, and how would you strategically place Ford if you saw them as a threat to the industry? Oh, sure. The car I'm driving today uh, is a Taurus, which is the, recognizes the best larger sedan, uh, because we, ha uh, we have five kids, and a lot of times they end up together, so we, uh, the bigger car works. Um, on... Just an aside, when we agreed that we we're going to make the best cars in the world in a complete family, I also suggested all to the executives in that world headquarters that they drive a, either a, for, a new Ford vehicle or a competitor's car. And the, the person that, run, that was the attendant in the, flight in, the, in the garage wouldn't allow a foreign vehicle, to, or a, not a foreign vehicle, but a non-Ford car to come in. So I actually had to go down and chat with the fellow that that was a part of the plan, because he just wanted to know it was part of the plan. So it was fun to drive all the different vehicles. Um, Tesla uh, is a $30,000 car 
that rides along on a $70,000 battery. And we have great $30,000 cars um, at Ford. And if you want to, uh, if you want a, a hybrid with a, a small uh, electric drivetrain and a small battery, or you want a plug-in hybrid with a bigger battery, uh, maybe like a seven or eight kilowatt hour battery, uh, you can get that at Ford. Or if you want an all electric vehicle, which has like a 23 and a half kilowatt hour battery that weighs about uh, 5, 000, uh, five, 800 pounds and um, costs around $15,000, this is on a $30,000 car. We have that for you also. So whatever you want, uh, you can get. Electric vehicles today make no sense. They're fun to drive because you have all this torque at the lower RPM. They win all the drag races, and they're just fun. But we have got to get the price of the batteries and the cost of the batteries and then the weight of the batteries and be able to manage each of those cells a lot more efficiently, which is probably going to be a different chemistry than lithium ion that we have today. But uh, Elon, we know, I know Elon well. Um, it, uh, a $100,000, $120,000 car does not fit Henry Ford's vision of opening the highways to all mankind. Uh, at the turn of the century, Henry Ford was really good friends with Thomas Edison, and all the Ford vehicles 113 years ago were all electric. So we've been working on these batteries forever, and you're all going to get a chance to do this, because this is, as, is MIT. And, we, and the biggest opportunity we have to, from technology is to find the next chemistry of batteries so we could actually make batteries that are affordable, that have great storage capability. Because then, we, the whole, I'll just give you an example, the, the grids around the world are, are all sized by hot days in big cities. So in the United States, it's, it's California on a hot day, but we can't store any electricity. So if we had batteries that we could store it, we could actually move the electricity from the batteries to the grid, to our homes, to the cars. And then, if we get batteries that make sense on cost, we could actually have the world that we really do want to have, and that is to use your electricity clean. But that doesn't get us all the way there, right? Because what we've got to do about the creation of our, ener of our energy? Because it's not going to make any difference about being efficient on the use of it if we don't get to the place where we're actually generating our energy in a clean way. And we, all the citizens of the world, are going to be the ones that decide that. So I encourage you to be inside that debate, not just technically, but from a policy point of view. OK. Uh, there you are. Hi. Hi, my name is Elena Pleatman. I'm in the MBA class of 2016. And Fantastic. grew up in a suburb of Detroit. Oh, really? Um, Which one? West Bloomfield. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so cool, cool place. When you were uh, taking over the company, not only was the auto industry uh, going bankrupt, but the city of Detroit went bankrupt as well. Um, so I was wondering how you thought about your role, um, not only as turning around Ford, but impacting the city of Detroit and also what you think about the future of the city. Oh, you bet. Um, well, um, it's a really tough situation in Detroit, as you well know. It used to have, uh, and you probably grew up with this, 1.8 million people. And now uh, they're less than like 350,000. And so you can imagine that the consolidation that needs to take place to make that viable. And they have all their little townships and all of their infrastructure, and it's just not viable. And as you, as you pointed out, uh, mismanaged for many, many years, and they actually went through bankruptcy. But the, the way we think about it is that the most important thing we could do at Ford is to create a viable, profitably growing company and, and actually provide great jobs and great careers. And so that economic development is the best thing we could do. And in this last three years, we've hired 45,000 uh, employees across throughout the United States, and uh, many of them in Michigan. So um, I feel really good about that. And, and everybody, but I would just point out that uh, through cities throughout the world, not just the United States, so many of the cities have lived beyond their means and their pension obligations and their wage and, and benefits uh, that they're giving to all of their public employees are not sustainable either. It's a, it's a huge liability on most of the big cities throughout the United States and also around the world. So again, for all of us, uh, getting in that debate about how we live within our means um, and also how we create a viable um, environment for businesses to grow, because the only way, the only way for this all to work, and you know this come, being in a great school like MIT, is if we, if the, led by industry, if we have businesses that are profitably growing so that all the stakeholders and all the communities in which we operate can all benefit. Because if you're not growing as a company, then you're dying. 
And we just got to keep remembering how important that leadership is to create that environment. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Molali. My name is Jude Njugo. I am a Sloan Fellow. Where are you? I'm here. There you are. Fine. There you are. <laughs> all, yeah. your, all your colleagues are yeah. helping you there. Yeah. So what's the most difficult leadership decision you've had to make in your, in your journey? Most difficult leadership decision? Well, okay, I haven't shared this story, but I think it's because of your smile I'm going to share this. <laughs> Plus, she's taken 85 photos. <laughs> you should come up here and take it. Here, come up here. Come, come here. Here. So take a photo of me with all my friends. Okay. Good job. <laughs> can, can you take a selfie with that? Do you know how to do a selfie? Uh, yeah, here. Oh, okay. Here. Okay. Okay, here, here we are talking to the Sloan. Good job. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Okay, so here's a story that I'm going to share with you. Um, I would say uh, one of the biggest leadership decisions I've ever made is to decide to move uh, to move to uh, participative management. And, and that's, a, that's a really big decision. And all of you are going to go through this journey where you're going to move from I to we, and you're going to move from me to service. You're all going to go through it. Trust me. Just start thinking about it now, because you get a chance to decide where you want to be on those spectrums. Are you going to be more about I? Are you going to move to we? Are you going to be about me? Or are you going to be about service to whatever you commit your life to? So here, here's my journey. And it's, a, and it's a decision you have to make. So I joined Boeing, and I want to be the best engineer in the world. And I'm doing great, and I'm, uh, they're giving me more and more responsibility. And then they called me in one day, and they said, uh, we'd like you to be a supervisor. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, we're going to assign you uh, engineers to work for you, and you're going to supervise them. And I thought, oh, I get it. I'm gonna, they're going to assign me an engineer that needs my help to create them in my image. And so they assigned my first, my first employee. You know how many hundreds of thousands of millions of employees I've had since then? This is my first employee, my first employee. So his name's Mike. And uh, so at the time, when you did technical work, you would do your technical work, and then you'd sign your name, and then you'd have to go into your supervisor, and your supervisor would sign below. And so I thought my job was to teach this person to be just like me. So 14 iterations later on his technical work, he comes in with, the, for the 14th time, he's changed this thing in response to my dynamite suggestions. <laughs> and, and he puts it down. He said, now, uh, before you give me another suggestion, I would like you to know that I'm quitting. <laughs> I said, quitting? He said, I'm quitting the company because of you. And I said, Mike, what? I mean, of course, you can imagine my life's flashing before my eyes. This career is not going very well now. I said, why are you quitting? He said, well, I really think we reached the point of diminishing returns about 10 iterations ago. And they're all great suggestions, but it's just driving me nuts. I can't be managed like this. And I said, OK. And so what do you, what do you think? Is there anything? What, what should I learn from this? And, and, and Mike said, well, you know, Alan, you're really a neat person, and I think you're, you're going to be a great leader someday, but you might want to think about what your real job is. Maybe what the company is asking you to do is to um, ensure that I, have, I know what the, what the plan is, I know what the strategy is, where do I fit in, am I network with the right people, do I have the right resources, and then some technical guidance along the way too. 
but maybe that's your real job instead of my, doing my job with me. Uh, I said, you sure, you sure I can't ask you to get you to stay? He said, nope, out of here. So my first employee quit. And I thought about that and thought about that. And to, and to your question, the biggest decision I made, and thank goodness that happened with my very first employee, that I started on the journey from I to we and me to service, and what was, my, what was I really going to do with my contribution going forward? And it changed my life for the, for the, for the better. Okay, now, Deborah's standing up and she says, we've got to go. So my last thing I want to tell you is it's so neat to be with you. You, you can't believe what a great school that you're in. And for you to do this and get a chance to serve the world, and the world needs you more than ever. So please go ahead and finish your work and get out there and follow your passion, and let's continue to change this world for the better. Okay? Thank you very much.